Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you're joining with us for worship today. You know, last week we talked a bit about discipleship and growing the kingdom of God. And I just wonder if you've had a chance this week to uh, expand the kingdom in some way. You can uh, talk about that in the comments section. We'll just give you a couple of minutes to say hello to one another, get a coffee if you need to, grab your Bible and, uh, and chat, you know, how you've gone about growing the kingdom of God in your week. Okay, we'll give you a couple of minutes now and we'll see you back here for the Bible reading. Okay, I hope you've got your Bible and you can read along with me at home. I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them, those were the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here these last few days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together and said, it's true, the Lord has risen. He has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning and uh, welcome also to church at the home and those who are in all different places, couples, individuals, uh, families with children. A special welcome to the children. And children, I have a question for you. And uh, that is, when was the last time you played hide and seek? You can't remember that long ago? Just the other day, how exciting. Well, we used to play hide and seek at primary school and the way we played it was uh, you would, one person who was it would count by fives. I'm not sure why they counted by fives, but five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, up to 100, while people scattered and found hiding places. And then you'd leave the base and go looking for the people. And if you saw them, you'd call out their name and you'd run back to base and tag base before they were running trying to get there before you. And some people would sneakily move around behind the shelter sheds and get back to base without being seen. And then they were safe. And there's different ways of playing hide and seek. And I know you can play it at home with brothers and sisters. And you, if you find a really good hiding place, sometimes it backfires, doesn't it? Sometimes the low thing about hide and seek is you can find such a good place that everyone gives up looking for you. And that gets very boring, doesn't it? Because you're sitting there hiding in a place that's so good, you don't want anyone to know where it is, but everyone else is gone. Well, Jesus was playing hide and seek with his disciples after the resurrection. Did you know that? There's six occurrences at least where it's described where Jesus appears to his disciples. And on a number of these occasions, they don't instantly recognise him. It's like he's there, but like he's also hidden. Now, maybe, children, I just want you to think for a second, answer this question with your parents or with your parent, whoever you're with. Can you think of uh, the answer to some of these instances? One was Mary in the garden. Can you remember who she mistook Jesus to be? She thought he was someone else. Do you know who that was? I'll give you a moment. And then do you, rem- do you know what Jesus did to show that it was him? What helped her to recognise him? Now, a little bit of a harder one. There was Peter and John went fishing and uh, Jesus was on the beach, but they didn't recognise uh, them. And uh, what was it that they, Jesus told them to do something and something happened immediately after that that helped them to recognise it was Jesus? Do you know what that was? Parents might need to help you with that one. If you're not sure, they'll need to look up in John chapter 20 and chapter 21 for that one just there. So I'll leave that with you to explore. The other one is the story that we had read today. Can you remember when Tanya read out, what was the time that the two men walking to Emmaus recognised that it was actually Jesus with them? It was quite late in the story. What was it that Jesus did that they recognised him? Have a think about that and and answer that to each other. Well, I want to try and uh, suggest two reasons why they couldn't recognise Jesus immediately. And I want you to remember these reasons, uh, children and the adults as well, of course. The first reason is that Jesus' body was changed. 
It was a resurrection body and it was different. Jesus actually turned up inside a house with a locked room without barging through the door or through the roof or climbing in through a window. He just appeared. And then in the story we had read, Jesus disappeared when the people had recognised him. So his body seemed to be able to dematerialise and materialise again. It was a very different sort of body to what we, we have. We can't do that, can we? But it was also the same body in a way because they could still see the holes in his hands and his feet and in his side. Remember, he said to Thomas, put your hand in my side, look at my, the holes in my hand and feet. Just stop your doubting, believe. So, and he ate a piece of fish just to show that he wasn't a ghost uh, and to show that he must have had a digestive system and a body like ours. So Jesus' body was different, it was changed and yet it was still similar. The second reason that I believe the disciples didn't always recognise Jesus is because they needed to change. And let me explain that to you. So there's our two reasons why they didn't recognise Jesus. One, because Jesus was changed, his body was changed. And secondly, they needed to change. What do I mean by that and how, did they, how could they go about being changed? So two things for that. The first is that notice about these two people, we don't know if it's a man or a wife or two men, uh, these two people, disciples of Jesus, they're very downcast. They're very sad, aren't they? Because they've been involved in Jerusalem where Jesus was arrested, handed over to the Romans by their own people, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, and he was put to death. And, and they have lost all their great hopes about what was going to happen. They understood Jesus was a great prophet, mighty in word and deed, and they expected him to redeem Israel. By that they meant, they thought he would uh, get rid of the Roman armies who patrolled their streets and who taxed them very heavily, so they had to give over a lot of the money they earned and they had not a lot left to live on. So people were hungry, they were desperate and they could be commanded to do all sorts of things for Roman soldiers at any time. Uh, to carry their loads for them for a, a mile or more and they could be brutally treated. So they, they believed that Jesus was the prophet who would set them free to be able to worship and live freely in their own country. That was not to be, it seemed. Jesus was killed. And so suddenly their world was torn apart and the way they imagined things fell into little pieces crumbled on the ground. And so the first thing sometimes for people to change is, is we need the things we're so sure and certain about to sometimes fall apart. Not that that's enjoyable or that God wants that to happen to us, but it's sometimes when everything's stripped away that we become teachable in a new way. We become open to new thoughts, new ideas, to considering beliefs about God and, and exploring questions about God and what our life means and how God works, where we're otherwise too busy in the ordinary run of life and entertainment and work and getting money and doing all the things we do. So these are, that's the first thing, the, the teachable moment when things sometimes fall apart, a bit like what the world's experiencing now with the coronavirus and many people, sadly, some more than others have had things stripped away, loss of jobs and income, even loss of loved ones and not being able to celebrate their life in a funeral with, with others. All sorts of losses people have made. Uh, and so we're caused to search, what's the meaning of this? What are we learning in this time? What might we learn about God? The second thing, uh, that I think we learn from this passage that needs, is needed for people to change, to be able to see Jesus. Firstly is to become teachable by sometimes having our ordinary everyday world disrupted so that we have, we have to ask new questions. Secondly, we need at that time to receive God's word. We need to hear from God so that it's not just a, a vacuum of, of emptiness. And that's what happened with these two people, that Jesus began, as he listened to them, he opened up the word of God, familiar scriptures, but he opened them up and gave them fresh understanding so that they could see that the Messiah that they were looking to kick out the Romans 
actually didn't come to do that. He came, he had to suffer. That was part of God's prophetic plan, part of his plan from the beginning. And that the salvation, the rescue that he came to bring was not so much a political or an economic one, but it was a a rescue from ourselves, from the sin that we're captive to, from our greed and our selfishness and our complacencies and indifference and our lack of care for one another. And these are the things that Jesus wants to set us free from through bringing us the word of, of God. And so Jesus opens these things up to them. Now that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus says in one place that we can't see the kingdom of God unless we're born again, unless a change from the Holy Spirit from above comes to us and opens our eyes to see the kingdom of God. And of course, when we see Jesus, we see the kingdom of God in a person because wherever Jesus was, there the kingdom of God was. God was healing in Jesus. God was setting people free in Jesus. God was confronting injustice in Jesus. There's the kingdom of God in action. And so people needed new eyes. And Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. So with the words of Jesus coming in, so our eyes are opened by the spirit of God to see the kingdom of God in Jesus and recognize him. So there's our two factors, our two things that are needed for people to recognize Jesus, both a teachable heart when things sometimes are disrupted and we ask questions. And secondly, the word of God brought to us uh, through Jesus, through the Bible, whether we listen to it on an app on our phone, the Bible in one year or some other app, or whether we uh, join a study group and uh, study the Bible together or through coming today, church in the home and listening uh, to God's word all different ways of allowing Jesus to speak to us so that we can recognise him. Now, one of the um, questions that Tanya asked us uh, last week was, uh, what does it mean to be a disciple? And I think, again, we're helped today as Jesus opens up the word of God from Moses through all the prophets. And Moses, at one point, predicted that there would be a prophet who would come uh, who would be like Moses and that when he comes, listen to him. Those were Moses' words, listen to him. Now, a prophet like Moses would be a very special prophet. They would be someone who would bring a law, like Moses brought the law and brought the covenant, the agreement between God and Israel. So this prophet like Moses, it's most likely that he would be bringing a fresh understanding of the law and bringing a new covenant such as Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, prophesied a covenant where the law was within our hearts. And this is what Jesus came to be. And on the Transfiguration Mountain, and you can read this again in Mark and Matthew, uh, on the Transfiguration Mountain when Jesus is there and the disciples notice Moses and Elijah come to talk with Jesus and a cloud comes over them and the voice from the cloud says, this is my son whom I love, Listen to him. Listen to him. So those words are used of Jesus. And that's the first thing for a disciple. How to be a disciple is to listen to Jesus and learn from him. That's what a disciple is. So to be a disciple means listening to Jesus through his word. And uh, we begin as a disciple when we meet Jesus. We encounter him through his word, uh, through his spirit. Uh, as we open up our hearts and lives to him. But we don't stop there. We go on listening to Jesus and allowing his word to shape our lives. We don't just listen in order to build up a whole lot of head knowledge so that we've just, we can answer all the questions top of the class. No, Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and do it. So once we listen and hear the word, We're to put it into practice straight away in whatever way we can. And that's how Jesus is formed within us. We become little by little more like Jesus because we're listening to him. We're observing how he lived and what he taught. And we're seeking to put that into practice in our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit who Jesus has given to us. And so we become more like him. And so the kingdom of God grows because the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is. And when Jesus lives in us more and more, so the kingdom of God grows on earth. 
So that's what it means to be a disciple, to let the word of God change us into more loving, caring people, into more honest, truthful people, into people with more courage uh, to confront wrong and to people who are generous uh, to provide for the needs of the poor and who are compassionate for those in need. They're all aspects that Jesus uh, wants to shape in us. Now, the other question Tanya asked was, who are you discipling? And a question that might go along with it is, well, there's a lot of people I know and who are my friends, but how do I disciple them? And that's where Jesus, with these two men on the road or two people on the road, really helps us. Notice what he does. First, he comes alongside them like a friend. He's traveling with them on their journey. He shares in their journey and their life. Secondly, he asks them questions, open questions. How are you going? What is it you're talking about? Questions. So he's not coming in to just, just straighten them out and tell them a whole lot of things. He's listening to them and listening to them deeply, closely. And we're called to listen to people in such a way that they know they're cared about and that they have our full attention. And as we listen, we'll pick up needs or hurts or heart hopes that people have and we'll have more insight through the help of the Holy Spirit, how the word of God can be shared with them. Words of hope, words of comfort, words of encouragement, words of blessing, so that we build people up rather than the world, which so often pushes people down, doesn't it? And tells them they're not good enough or that, you know, they have to fit a certain image to be acceptable or be a certain type of person. But Jesus isn't like that. Jesus sees the heart not the outward appearance. And so our words can bless people and address their heart, hopes and needs. And that's a way we can help disciple others, help draw them to Jesus so that they see Jesus in us and they're drawn and attracted to Jesus and to the kingdom of God. Now, there's another game of hide and seek that I didn't mention at the start. We talked about Jesus being a bit hidden and about people needing to seek him and how they can go about that. Remember uh, the two uh, things, being teachable and uh, receiving the word of God. But there's another game of hide and seek that's going on because Jesus said, the son of man, that means Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus himself is seeking us. And sometimes we're the ones hiding. Instead of God or Jesus hiding and us seeking him, we're the ones who are hiding. We think, no God, I don't think you'd like what you see and there's things in my life I don't want to change and maybe we like it the way it is and we're afraid of change. Even though Jesus promised that when he comes, he will come to give us life in all its fullness, in abundance, much more fuller and better than the fears and the anxieties and the, and the hurts that we can sometimes hold on to. Jesus wants to set us free. And he says, those who receive my word and put it into practice, they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. So this other game of hide and seek, those who want to disciple others, who Jesus calls all of us, uh, who are disciples to disciple others, we're to join with Jesus in seeking out the lost. So we don't just seek Jesus, we also seek the lost, those who don't yet know him. And as we seek them, we can follow what Jesus did with these two followers and reach out to people with friendship and compassion and love. And sometimes we need to be quite direct in love, uh, sometimes with someone we've got to know well, to maybe challenge them as others have challenged us in our lives to help us to come to Jesus. So where are you in this game of hide and seek? Are you hiding from God? and afraid of God and needing to maybe come out of hiding. This is a game where you don't win by staying hidden forever. In fact, allowing Jesus to find you makes you the winner of the game. It's the best part to be found. Are you seeking him? Well, take encouragement that those who seek him, the word promises that they will find him when they seek him with all their heart. Seek and you will find. Ask and you'll receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. They are his promises to you. And if, if you are wondering, how can I seek the lost? Where do I start? Be a friend to people. Be a good friend and listen deeply 
and allow God as he shapes his love in you to share that love with others and be willing to bless others with your words and with acts of kindness and be bold sometimes to speak a word appropriate to the need and the situation to invite others to consider Jesus when they reflect on what he's done in your life as you share that with them. So I want to encourage us all to be seekers of God and seekers of those who don't yet know him in love and in the confidence that it's God who is seeking and it's God who saves. And remembering too that prayer is so much a part of this because I need to tell you that there is someone else playing this game but he doesn't play by the rules and he is interrupting this game of hide and seek and trying to change those who are hiding into blind people. He's putting a blindness over people so they can't see Jesus. And it says in his word that the God of this age, meaning Satan, comes to blind the eyes and blind the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we need to be praying for our friends and praying for those who don't yet recognise Jesus, that the veil will be removed, that the blindness will give way to sight as Jesus opens all of our eyes to who he really is. Shall we pray? Lord, we want to see Jesus. Give us a hunger and thirst for your word in which and through which you reveal yourself. Help us not to give up easily, but to keep seeking. And Lord, help us to have such compassion for those who don't yet know you, that we would spend ourselves in seeking those who are lost, in reaching out in friendship to others, and in being bold and in our love and our sharing and our generosity towards others in their needs. And Lord, we pray that you would draw people to yourself as you promise, when Jesus is lifted up, when he is brought into full view, so he will draw many to himself. These things we pray so that your kingdom would come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. We humbly come before you with our prayers and petitions, knowing that you are fully able to meet all our needs. We bring before you this world, this wonderful world you've made, and ask on behalf of all people of all nations that you help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Help a suitable and effective vaccine be made available soon, Lord. We lift up all those who've lost loved ones to this virus and all of those we know who have lost our loved ones for other reasons recently. We ask for your comforting presence to be made known to them, especially at this time. In all the uncertainties of all our lives at the moment, we pray that you will be the anchor of our souls, the rock on which we stand and a fortress of protection. Please provide for the needs of all those in financial hardship at the moment and those with job insecurity, business overheads and all sorts of troubles. Lord, make all those paths smoother and lead people to be able to access what they need to get help at this time. For parents at home, Lord, and students at home, learning, we pray for grace and blessings over their households. For families struggling in domestic violence situations, Lord, we pray for protection, especially over the children. And we pray that abusers will recognise the harm they cause and get the help they need. Lord, for all those struggling with harmful addictions at this time, help them find less harmful and more healthy habits and addictions to replace them with. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, this brings us uh, towards the end of our time together today. We thank you once again for joining us for Church at Home. And uh, we just really pray that God will uh, be especially close to you this week and you'll be fully aware of his presence and draw close to him. Let me leave you with a little reading that I read this morning. It's a conversation between Jeremy and Jesus. Jeremy asks, Jesus... Why were the disciples always scared out of their minds when you appeared in the room? After all, they already knew you had risen from the dead. They should have been expecting you. Jeremy, disciples are like that. They get scared, think it can't be true, and instead of looking me in the face, they think I can't be for real. I need to poke them. And then they begin to catch on. But you're my disciple too. Are you a bit like that too? Jeremy says, I'm not sure, Jesus. I think more often I don't want to notice you are in the ordinary eating, chatting and working of life. If I knew you were there, I might have to celebrate life more seriously. I pray that you will know that Jesus is with you in your ordinary eating, uh, working at home sleeping, everything you do this week, and that you'll celebrate more seriously that he's with you. Bless you. Spirit, speak. Give us ears to hear when you